Hello and welcome to the Rethinking Cyber podcast with me, Rebecca McLaughlin Easton, brought to you in association with the Global Cyber Security Forum. In this third series, you'll hear my frank and thought-provoking conversations about the challenges and opportunities shaping our cyber future as I sit down with some of the world's greatest minds, eminent scientists, captains of the private sector and policymakers. My special guest today is Sir Jeremy Fleming, the former director of GCHQ, the Intelligence, Security and Cyber Agency of the United Kingdom. For 25 years, he was also the deputy director general at MI5, the UK's domestic counterintelligence and security agency. Sir Jeremy oversaw the establishment of the National Cyber Security Centre and created the UK's National Cyber Force. He currently advises global businesses on the intersection of technology, geopolitics and security. Sir Jeremy Fleming, it's great to see you. Thank you for talking to me today. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Jeremy, diving straight in, today we're going to be discussing the relationship between cybersecurity, intelligence and defence through the prism, through the lens, indeed, of your distinguished career. And, of course, if we look at the priorities and strategies that intelligence agencies and sectors implement to prevent disruptions to critical services and really ensure national security, let me ask you, what should they be putting right at the top of their priority list today? I think probably for the last 10 years or so, the intelligence world has worked out that cyber security is the thing it really has to pay attention to. And, and, and that's problematic, if you like, for the intelligence world, because we're used to operating you know, at the margins, in, in secret. Um, certainly, you know, not beyond uh, the uh, institutions of, 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 of governments, but we're used to operating in a way that doesn't usually come to the public's notice. And cybersecurity is a completely different challenge in that regard. Cybersecurity affects every single one of us. And so you're finding that intelligence agencies are being pulled into that space where they need to be more transparent and, transparent and open simply because of the cybersecurity agenda, where they need to have credibility with a different part of the population and where they need to be making those partnerships, civil society and and business and internationally, but in a different space. So, so cybersecurity, a top of the agenda, but, but also making intelligence agencies like my old one operate differently. And in what specific ways should they be doing things differently? Take us behind the scenes well as much as you can. Of course, I'm very conscious that I'm a, an ex-head of an agency, <laughs> so I need to be careful about that. But, but the, 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 the point here is that when you create an agency like in the United Kingdom, the National Cyber Security Centre, and when you make that part of an intelligence agency, then you know, that, that means that you, you have to operate more transparently. And in the UK, that meant recruiting different skills into the National Cyber Security Centre. It meant uh, creating different types of accommodation where civil society and business could come together with the agency. It meant investing very heavily in communications you know, to, uh, to, re to reach out, to explain try and help the public understand why there's a threat in cybersecurity and what they could um, uh, do about it. And sometimes, yes, it still means covert action, but at the other end of the, of the, of the spectrum, it, it's much more important, I think, that we are focusing on designing the next generations of safe technology, or we're focusing on how do we educate people so that they are using technology safely, or even using our power to make sure that it is a more inclusive environment, the more women are involved in cybersecurity, for example. So many interesting points you raise, but let me pick up on education, if I may, because it is critical, as we know, to have an informed workforce and a, an informed public to keep them safe in cybersecurity terms. How do you measure whether your messages are actually getting through? Yeah, that's a really good question, isn't it? And, and I mean, the answer is there are a whole load of metrics about the extent to which your message is pulled up. And, you know, this is your day job. You know, you understand completely how, how those those work. And so we can see the messages that work well and those that work less well. And, and as with any form of communication, it's about relevance. So if you're if you're communicating in a way that is relevant to you and your personal life, 
a message about password security. No point me banging on telling you you've got to have three random words in your password if you're if you don't understand why that's important to you, why that could make you uh, more open, uh, less open to um, a serious. Uh, criminal crime or fraud or you know why that is helping to keep your family more secure if you adopt it and 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 you know they, we have to make sure that we're getting the relevance of communication right but but if you were to zoom out a bit and I think you'd have to say that there are some areas where we're doing well I think we've got the messages through at least in the United Kingdom around some of these basics backing up security passwords making making sure that your software is up to date but if you were to look at whether we're having an impact on say ransomware then clearly we're not and you know that's an international problem we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that we're getting the traction required on the threats that are affecting people in their daily lives governments don't stand alone or as many believe they shouldn't in this evolving cyber landscape which would imply that collaboration more knowledge sharing is absolutely critical certainly at a domestic and a national level we do want to see more PPPs as discussed my question to you is how do we turbocharge those partnerships whilst making sure that we're also fostering innovation and underpinning economic growth. Yeah, I heard someone say the other day in relation to an, you know, an operational scenario around around conflict that wouldn't it wouldn't it be great to see some of the ingenuity we see in in uh, projecting conflict in uh, in in other areas of global governance or in uh, the way in which we're trying to establish norms or the, the way in which we're trying to um, in, you know if you like impose a cost on bad behaviors we, there's a need for a lot more ingenuity around all of that and my personal view is that the only way we're going to do that is if we have much better private public partnership now in the in the UK we've we've tried a number of things here some of them have worked really well you know there are a hundred of the UK's top businesses inside the National Cyber Security Center and the deal there is, you know, you bring your experience, you bring your network, you can bring your data if you want to. It's not a pre prerequisite, and uh, and you get a ringside seat as as uh, as the NCSC tries to develop policy, or you get a ringside seat as it tries to help respond to um, incidents. And so the, the, the I think the key takeaway from that is that it has to be a, a quid pro quo. You know, there's no, nothing to be gained from saying to you know, a bit of the private sector, just come along here and bring all your stuff and we might tell you something. You know, that has to be a relationship of equals. And I think particularly in, in cyberspace, you know, the governments don't have a monopoly on cyber information. They don't have a monopoly, obviously, on a technology. The only way they're going to be able to make this secure is to have a better partnership. So, Jeremy, for those who maybe weren't in the room, what were the key messages that you shared with people at the 2024 annual meeting of the Global Cybersecurity Forum in Riyadh? Well, it was my first time in Riyadh. And so I, I had actually not much of an idea what to expect. And there were a couple of things that really stood out for me. The, the, the first was that there was real continuity with discussions that I hadn't been present at from previous years. So I like the way in which the, uh, our, our, our hosts had attempted to bring some continuity to this discussion. All, all too often, it feels like we're discussing the same things again and again. The, the second thing that stood out for me was the, the way in which there was a real emphasis on action. Now, uh, you know, action in this space is quite hard to find. But a, a commitment to do some practical things, to start to build the coalitions, to, to do some things that start to build the private public partnerships that we've talked about so much, uh, a commitment to continuing to keep inclusion in this conversation. I thought that was all really impressive. Lastly, given your 30 plus years of international God, you made me sound so old. No. <laughs> given that you are 30 years young in the industry, Jeremy, let me put it that way, when it comes to your domestic and international intelligence work, what inspires you most going into 2025? And also, what is the biggest fear factor for you? Well, I'm really inspired about the potential of this latest generation of technology. I, I really am on the side of the tech optimist when we talk about what can happen. But I, I am uh, equally concerned that we approach the next generations of technology having learned the lessons of the recent past. And so I, uh, I, I want us to uh, continue to focus on adoption. I want us to make sure that when we're thinking about technology, we are looking at the possibilities, but we've got to do that with our eyes wide open, which I, I think is 
so important for humanity and is central to the way in which we tackle those really important questions. So I, uh, I, I think that it, it, it can't be a, a fear-driven conversation. It needs to be a very practical, operationally focused uh, conversation on the, the things we can do to realise that tech future. Exactly. And speaking of focused conversations, let me thank you for hours in the podcast studio. And we very much look forward to seeing you again on the grounds next year in Riyadh. I look forward to that too. Thank you. And so it just remains for me to also thank you, our global audience, for listening. And you can find all previous episodes in the series on Apple and Spotify. Another podcast episode is coming your way soon, so be sure to follow GCF on social media for updates. And I very much look forward to welcoming you on the ground at the 2025 annual meeting of the Global Cybersecurity Forum. But for now, take care and goodbye. Thank you.